Okay, no, 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 it's fine, it doesn't need to. Nope, it's fine. It's good. You want me to turn? So, once upon a time, there was a man named Mullah Nasruddin. Mullah is well known in Islamic folklore as being the wise fool. Or in other words, he teaches us acts of wisdom through foolishness. Well, as Mullah got older, he became known as some kind of sage or teacher, and he traveled around to different towns transmitting information. One day, Mullah was approached by a very famous town. They went to his dwelling, and they rolled out the red carpet for him. They brought him a feast of delicacies. They brought musicians, dancers. They greeted him with all the traditional Sufi greetings. And they said, Sufi of Sufis, Murshid, Ya Hazim, wise one, teacher, please, come bestow upon us your wisdom. Mullah thought about it, and he agreed. And the town said, Come to us on Friday, because that's when the entire town gathers together. And you can address the entire congregation at once. So, Mullah agrees, and on Friday he heads towards the town. Now, the reason why this town was famous is they were known as the largest collection of fools. In the entire region. So on Friday, Mullah gets there. And after the prayers are done, he stands up in front of the congregation and he says to them, Now, does anybody know what I'm about to tell you? But no one wanted to get it wrong and look like a fool. So they all said, No, Mullah, we don't know. Please teach us. Bestow upon us your wisdom. And Mullah looks at him and he pulls on his chin sternly and he says, Well, if you don't already know, then you're too foolish for me to tell you. And then he walks out of the room. <laughs> the town is crushed. A week goes by. And the town sends another delegation. Same thing, red carpet. Music, entertainment, food. Mullah, please. We'll do better this time. Mullah agrees, he goes back and on Friday after the prayers. And he stands up in front of the congregation and he says to them, Now, does anybody know what I'm about to tell you? And all at once, almost as if it was choreographed, everyone stands up and says, Yes, Mullah, we know. And Mullah says, Well, if you already know, there's no point in me telling you. And he walks out of the room. <laughs> as you can guess, another week, another delegation, same thing, feast music, dancers, Mullah agrees. And on Friday, he's back at the town and he sits through their prayers and after the prayers are done, he stands up in front of the congregation and he says, Now, does anybody know what I'm about to tell you? <laughs> and then, half of the room stands up and says, Yes, Mullah, we know. And the other half of the room stands up and says, But we do not know, so tell us. And Mullah says, Well, how about the half of you that knows tells the half of you that doesn't know? <laughs> he walks out of the room. That was all the town could take. Years go by. And Mullah was out traveling, teaching, transmitting information. And he just happens to be passing by the town. And it just happened to be Friday in the afternoon. And he says, mm, I'll go in and check up on them and see how they're doing. So he sits in with the prayers. And after the prayers are done, everyone's just kind of sitting there in this awkward silence. And Mullah thinks to himself, why not? And so he stands up in front of them and says, Now, does anybody know what I'm about to tell you? And all at once, everyone stood up and walked out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and so the point of the story is this. Whenever we embark on a new journey, we start something new. Whether it's chiropractic adjustments, a musical instrument, a spiritual path, a new relationship, Humans have this tendency to act like the people in the town. At first, we look for a savior. We need someone to come save us, teach us. We don't know anything. And then after that, we learn just a little bit of information and we do a complete 180 degree turn. And now I know everything. And we're trying to teach everyone else. And it doesn't take very long before we start to realize that we don't know everything. After that, it's just a matter of staying on the path where the half of you that knows teaches the half of you that does not know and reminds you, reminding yourself that this can be done. 
And then the part of us that doesn't know continues to teach the part that does know. It says and reminds us, we don't know everything yet. Please, keep going. And then after that, the answer at the end of the path is silence. Because there's no more questions. You just know what you know. And you know what you do not know. And that's when you know it so well, there's no reason to talk about it. And the final result is silence. Which is what we will all experience during the taking of this examination. Silence. So, Ish Haisa, Dr. Brent Fassbinder. <laughs> Binder is a German name. And fortunately, in the United States, it's still Binder, it's pronounced Binder. However, it's often mispronounced Binder. But Binder isn't like a, a type of binding that they know in German. It's more of a Mappa, right? Yeah, in German, it's like a folder. A binder is a folder. So thankfully, when people mispronounce my name as Binder, they think of a folder and not a bone binder, because that doesn't sound very appealing. I'd rather go to a dentist than a bone binder. And many practices in the United States, they name their practices with their name and the word chiropractic. So they say Jones Chiropractic or Peter Chiropractic or whatever. And if I called it Binder Chiropractic, everyone would have just assume it was Binder Chiropractic. And that doesn't sound like a very comfortable kind of chiropractic. <laughs> so that's why I call it pain relief chiropractic. <laughs> Paradoxically, what we do with chiropractic is the opposite of binding. It's Feiheit. It's freedom from the bindings. Increase of range of motion. Now, my mother's great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, he left Naples, Italy and came to Ellis Island, New York City, and his last name was Cracker, which no one could pronounce, so they just called him Cracker, <laughs> which means I'm this close to being Dr. Cracker, the chiropractor. <laughs> it has a better ring to it, doesn't it? I think given the current linguistic trend of the phenomenon of YouTube on chiropractic, that Dr. Cracker would be good marketing because people kind of like to get cracked, but not everybody. Some people are still scared to get cracked. And many American chiropractors almost are offended when people say cracking. It's like a big deal to them. So they try to remedy the situation and educate their patients and say, it's not cracking, it's cavitation. They're very serious about teaching everybody this word. And patients will come to me from other practices and say, are you going to crack me? <gasps> I didn't mean to say that. I mean cavitation. And I say, it's okay. I don't care <laughs> if, you say, if you say crack. Me. That's the layman's term for the medical term of cavitation. The difference between cracking and cavitation is semantical. Mm -hmm. It's just a word. However, there is a big difference between manipulation and adjustment. Manipulation was proposed by A.T. Still in 1892 in Kansas. He's the father of osteopathy, as many of you know. And he proposed that manipulation of the joints would increase humoral flow or blood flow, bringing oxygen and nutrients to those tissues. Three years later, Daniel David Palmer in Iowa proposed that chiropractic adjustments of the spine would not increase blood flow, but increase neural flow, and thus bring life and health to the tissues. Now, what we know today is that one response after a manipulation of the spine is not an increase, but an alteration of neural flow from sympathetic to parasympathetic, which causes vasodilation and brings more blood into the, into the tissues. So, they both had a piece of the puzzle. I also find it very interesting that these two men who wrote extensively about their lives and their travel, that neither of them had ever known each other. And, or at least we believe, or we think that they didn't know each other, because neither of them had ever mentioned it. 
But they both had this very similar idea in a very similar time period in a very close approximation with each other. In 1922, historians William Ogburn and Dorothy Thomas began a discussion regarding something called the phenomenon of simultaneous discovery. This is when more than one person has the same idea at the same time in completely different locations. For example, in the late 1600s, a man named Gottfried Leibniz and Isaac Newton both developed theories <laughs> That's right, they did. They both developed theories on calculus. In the late 1800s, a man named Alfred Wallace and another man named Charles Darwin developed theories on evolution. There are at least three different mathematicians who claim to be the sole inventor of decimal fractions. The molecule oxygen was discovered independently in a lab in Sweden and also one in England. Logarithms were invented by two different mathematicians, one in Switzerland, one in Britain. Color photography was invented nearly simultaneously in two different places in France. Typewriting machines were invented by multiple people in Europe at the same time as it was being by, invented by multiple people in America. My personal favorite, in the late 1800s, two men began using spinal manipulation therapy in their healing and medical practices. One of them was named A.T. Still, who would later become the father of osteopathy, and the other was D.D. Palmer, who would later become the father of chiropractic. Neither of them had ever met or knew anything about the other person. This is where it gets a little bit more strange. In the year 1609, there were four independent discoveries of sunspots, namely by Galileo in Italy, Shiner in Germany, Fabricius in Holland, and Harriet in England. In the year 1847, there were four different developments of the law of conservation of energy. And they were by Joule, of course, and also Thompson, and Kolding, and also Helmholtz, all at the same time. There are at least five different engineers who claim to be the exclusive inventor of the steamboat engine. There are at least six different claimants to the invention of the thermometer, and there seem to be no less than nine people who claim to have invented the telescope. These are people pretty much showing up at a patent office at the same time with the same idea, completely different locations, without knowing each other whatsoever. And as of 1922, when Ogburn and Thomas first started this discussion, there were 148 documented examples of scientific breakthroughs occurring in more than one person simultaneously. Now, my disclaimer is this. This is not an argument against the individual innovator. As a matter of fact, I fully participate in the process of honoring and remembering the person who has the capacity to innovate and also the fortitude to execute their ideas and the stamina to sustain and develop their ideas for the betterment of humanity. And those people are in the room right now. Quickly, let's give them a round of applause really quick. Mm -hmm. But the phenomenon of simultaneous discovery is inviting us to consider another possibility. The possibility that there is a matrix of ideas that we all have access to. That there is a cloud of thoughts that we're all using to think. And when someone is focused on an idea that is still developing, it moves the energy into the form of innovation. And that these ideas are not being invented from within, but that they are coming down and then through us. The chiropractic adjustment or mainly, many things that you do with your practice is very similar of being in that moment with someone and whether you're putting your hands on their spine or any part of their body, but there's this moment where you let go of all of that. And then something comes through you. Now, we also have to remember that even though D.D. Palmer and A.T. Stills were inventing chiropractic and osteopathy in the 18, 18, late 1800s, that people have been cracking people's backs for thousands of years. In traditional Chinese medicine, which is known as Sui now, is Chinese joint manipulation that's been happening for at least 5,000 years. And in Ayurvedic medicine in India, they have also been manipulating the spine. And in the Middle East, you can get your hair cut and your neck cracked. So, 
the importance is through the development of techniques that occurred with American chiropractic. And the development of those techniques which brought specificity and not uh, generality. And the main difference between manipulations and adjustments is the branch of physics and the concept of leverage. Where osteopathic manipulations may utilize more long lever adjustments where you change the fulcrum and you put stress and tension through multiple segments of the spine. Whereas in chiropractic adjustments, it becomes very specific and you use the piezoform bone to attach to the transverse process and you push in a very specific line of drive. It's a short lever adjustments. And the importance of that is with the specificity comes the potential for mastery. It's just different. Maybe you had an uncle or someone or a friend, you just say, okay, you can hug your back like this and then I'll pick you up and you can crack like that, right? You can crack like that, it works. But with this specificity comes a higher level of mastery and the potential to help more people and to help people who can't be helped with just that. Because the truth is, is that, you know, for people who just crack, crack or those are the easy ones. Those aren't the ones that are really stuck. Those are the ones that you just put your hands on and they'll go anyway. But when you get the ones that really stick, then you know what an adjustment is. Now, <clears throat> or, um, yes, my first name is Brent, which is an English name. And the, it comes from the southern western part of the UK, where there is a town called Brent Tor. And Brent Tor is a very famous town at the bottom of a hill, and at the top of the hill is a church. And the original Brents were the ones who came down from the church to transmit information to the town. And so, I am honored to be here to share everything that I know about American chiropractic. So, Danke fürs Kommen.